of the city of council of Gardner and order. <coughs> you please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Okay, uh, before we get started with the <laughs> presentations, uh, we've got a couple of guests in the uh, audience uh, that I'd like to, to point out, and actually I'm going to let Cheryl point out a couple of them, but I want to thank the uh, Boy Scouts in attendance that are here to, I guess, get citizenship merit badges, right? Everybody? Let's see, heads bobbing. Yes? Okay, very good. Well, thanks so much for coming. We, we Hope that uh, we hope that we keep you nice and bored this evening. Uh, and Cheryl. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Tonight we have um, our network administrator, who has joined us. Greg joins us um, from Independence Community College, where he was the vice president over IT, building maintenance and security. Brings us a wealth of expertise. He's hit the ground running, and he is soon to be bringing you the uh, RFP for the upgrade of our system, uh, our network system that you approved in the budget. Yeah. We also have tonight Jason, who is the new president and CEO of the Chamber of Commerce. You'll recall they asked the city to serve on a selection committee, so um, I represent the city and took a, played a significant role in the selection, recruitment, preparation of the job description to be able to get our new president here. So Jason's here, and he'll be coming back to speak to us at a later date. Wait, Jason, there we go. Everybody sees Jason. And can you pronounce Greg's last name for me? I'll let Greg pronounce his last name. <laughs> <laughs> Greg. It's Etchison. Etchison. Okay. Very good. Thanks so much for that. Uh, before we get started with the regular agenda items, uh, we've got a, a presentation this evening regarding the city's uh, pavement management program. Brian, good evening. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Mayor. The presentation this evening is on our approach and findings related to a comprehensive pavement management program. During the CIP tour in the fall of 2013, the council saw firsthand the condition of the streets within the city. Staff's challenge was to create a comprehensive program that looked at our entire residential and collector street network and create a long-term plan preserve all pavements that we could and reconstruct those that had failed. This comprehensive pavement management program is what staff is using as a basis for street preservation and reconstruction within the CIP. In addition to our street network, Public Works and Parks have been working to collect data and incorporate both the trail system and the parking lots within the pavement management system. <coughs> Mr. Abdul Yahaya is presenting the plan this evening. Abdul came to the city a little over a year ago from the Missouri Department of Transportation. He has spent untold hours learning the software, inspecting every mile of road within the city, meeting with other cities on their approach to pavement management, and learning countless computer models. Abdul, good evening. And it's you know what? It's good to know that there's somebody besides Jody Demoline that's been on every uh, foot of the, the, the street system in the, inside the city limits. So. Well, thank you for having me this evening. Um, it is my pleasure to present uh, all of my findings. Once again, this comprehensive pavement program, uh, we started this over a year ago. Um, and so in that, we were able to collect the necessary data to come and present an analysis of our needs of where we are and where we want to go as a city. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with our philosophy. Um, and that is keep the good roads good so to prevent premature failure, which increases the cost of maintenance. It's important when you think about a pavement management program that you think about maintaining your roads and not necessarily repairing them. Uh, maintaining always or more likely than not is going to be cheaper than to repair. Think of it, um, if you own a vehicle, uh, it's cheaper to get your oil changed routinely than to allow the oil to sit in there and lock up your engine and have to repair your whole engine. 
So if you think of it in that approach, um, that is how we're going to approach maintenance of our streets. So we have five steps that um, we want to focus on. Um, one of those steps is keeping our streets from failing. Um, rather than focusing on just certain sections of the city and keeping it in excellent condition, we want to make sure that we take a holistic view of our city and our network uh, because it's not going to benefit anyone uh, if just parts of our city um, street network is in good condition. With that, uh, we want to make sure that our conditions stay at fair or above, which is a PCI of 55, and I'll get more detail on what PCI stands for. Two, um, in our philosophy, we want to identify the streets that are beyond the service life. Um, with streets, they have a service life um, beginning and end, and typically uh, streets last 25 to 30 years with maintenance. Key statement there is with maintenance. If you do not maintain your streets, that life cycle is shortened, um, and we will see signs of that as well in this presentation. So our objective is in this plan is to identify those streets and reconstruct and repair those within the first three years of the program. Once again, if we eliminate uh, the areas where we have to repair, then we can get on a maintenance cycle. And that is what is key in this program, um, making sure that you have a cycle, what type of uh, preventive maintenance measures you do, and make sure that they're not all falling at the same exact time. So we went out and we purchased micropaver. Micropaver um, is a national um, renowned software that manages uh, pavement and infrastructure. It was actually developed by the U.S. Corps Army of Engineers in the 1970s. Um, the PCI index, which stands for Pavement Condition Index, um, was developed through this process and is nationally and globally used. So with micropaver, what does it do? It takes the guessing factor out of it. Um, micropaper is going to look at the system holistically, once again, making sure that we have a level of service that meets the needs of all of our citizens in Gardner. Number four, we want to make sure that we fall in line with the goals of the city council, which is to promote economic development. Um, if you have streets that are in good condition, um, it's more advantageous that somebody is going to be a patron at that establishment or that business. Um, maintain quality of life, smooth roads, simple as that equates to a better quality of life. I know when I hit a pothole, my day um, is less than pleasant, and especially if it has damage to my vehicle. Uh, increase infrastructure and asset management. The city is growing um, directly by the things we do and indirectly, um, and with that, we need to make sure that we maintain our street, our street infrastructure. Um, sometime, uh, sometime in the near future, development might open up and it's going to increase um, our influx traffic in that area, we need to make sure that we are ready to um, prepare to take on that influx, as well as improve fiscal stewardship. Simple, simple as this, if you maintain and you implement a pavement management program, it saves you money. Um, then guessing, or I'm gonna go to the worst is first. And what that means is you get a call, your streets in bad condition, we fix that. Well, we could have fixed um, some other streets as well in that area, but we didn't have a plan. And five, use proven uh, maintenance techniques. Um, streets are still using the same material, rocks and tar, rocks and uh, asphalt, uh, but the techniques are changing. We wanna make sure that we are not behind the curve here in the city of Garden. So, fundamentals of street preservation. Three things, maintenance, preservation, and repair. Once again, maintenance, preservation, and repair. Um, currently, we do a lot of street maintenance. You'll see throughout the city, if you just take a, a leisurely drive, a lot of crack sealing, um, asphalt patching, patching uh, pothole repair. These type of treatments are necessary. Um, however, we need to make sure that we are doing more than just uh, reactive maintenance proce procedures. Um, the second is street preservation, which I want to actually focus a little bit on because this is a step that we want to implement that we are not currently practicing. Uh, street preservation, um, we have two treatments that we are looking into, which is microsurfacing and chip sealing. Uh, microsurfacing is a polymer immersion process. 
and I'll get into detail, I'll get in, or maybe not too much detail, but I'll let you know what specific treatment this is. And then you also have a chip seal, um, which is an asphalt, um, liquid asphalt and aggregate, which aggregate is a technical term for rock um, process. Now what these two processes do, or these treatments do, is they actually extend the life of your pavement on average six to eight years. Now I said in the beginning, um, we want to make sure that we are preserving and getting to that 25 to 30 year life cycle. However, we're not currently doing anything to preserve our current good streets. Once again, back to our philosophy of making sure that we keep the good roads good. Third, no matter how well you maintain a road, you will have to come to that point where you have to repair and reconstruct. Um, and currently in our city, uh, we do have streets that have reached their, the end of their life cycle and we want to make sure that we are identifying those and planning properly on when to repair that. I like to use the, the analogy of if you own a home or you know someone who owns a home, if you have your roof, you have your furnace that keeps you warm in the winter and you have your air conditioner that keeps you cool in the uh, summertime. Well, if all three of those go out at the same time, well, you're going to be uncomfortable and you're going to be out of a lot of money. Um, and this is Kansas, so that if you, it goes out in the summertime, you still one week, you might have a day below zero, a day below uh, above zero, and you might have a hailstorm. And that is that correlates to you might have an influx of traffic in one part of your city um, just because of a festival, and that damage to our I wouldn't say damage, but that ex more influx of traffic will cause uh, deterioration to speed up, and we want to make sure that we are monitoring that. <coughs> so what is maintenance, prevention, and street repair? So do you see to your left you have, this is a typical crack seal. Um, what crack seal is, is moisture <coughs> will penetrate into your uh, asphalt, and you have your freeze thaw cycle. So in the winter time, the water gets in there, it freezes and expands, and then in the summertime, it evaporates, but then water is still eroding through that crack. And what we want to do is make sure that we uh, prevent that damage to get into our subgrade. So once again, that's what you see around the city. It's a lot of reactive uh, measures, which is maintenance, which is needed. You have to make sure that you have a three-step uh, process. Now, what do you do to extend that life? Well, that's the chip seal and the microsurfacing that I was talking about um, earlier. You will see top center um, a chip seal. And what chip seal is, once again, is liquid asphalt spread over your existing asphalt and then a layer of aggregate, once again, the technical term for rock, um, spread over one or two layers and then rolled into place. And what this does is it creates a protective barrier from moisture and those damages <coughs> that water as well as traffic um, um, the pressures and stresses of traffic on your system as well, or your street as well. Now this treatment, once again, will extend the pavement life six to eight years. Now if you think of that um, in the 25 to 30 year life cycle, you can potentially get two to three <coughs> treatments of this in the life cycle of uh, your pavement. And believe me, it's still significantly cheaper to do two to three treatments of this than to repair it in year 10 or year 15. On the lower ha center, you have microsurfacing. Well, let me, let me go back. Chip sealing, one drawback with chip sealing um, that mainstream has heard is that it is a little, it is a rougher surface. So the drive experience is not as of driving on asphalt. However, um, the protective measures of the purpose um, is vital. Um, City of Overland Park uses this on their residential and their low volume streets extensively. Um, one reason is because it is cheaper and um, it's actually about half the cost of microservice. Um, on the center, uh, well, the lower center, you have the microservicing. And microservicing is a polymer immersion mixture of water, asphalt, mineral fibers, a whole bunch of technical terms, but it is basically up to an inch application onto the existing asphalt, which gives you once again that six to eight years of extended life onto that uh, treated street. 
And then the last uh, measure, which is street repair and reconstruct, which most people are familiar with, is where you go in there and you mill off the top two to even four inches of existing asphalt uh, that has met its life cycle and you come back and you install brand new asphalt. But this is the most expensive um, maintenance uh, procedure. And you want to make sure that once again you stage when you do that. So micro paper, we talked about uh, purchasing micro paper about a year ago. Um, in that year, our time since, uh, we were able to go out and examine 205 lane miles, um, which is all of our street network. Um, that equates to over 12 million square miles. I can say that um, all 12 million square miles was inspected because I inspected it. Um, but I also want to say uh, about the PCI index, once again, the pavement condition index. Our, our residential and our collective streets have an average of 80.8 .8 PCI. That sounds good, it is good, um, it is in the satisfactory range. However, it is a little misleading. Um, in two, between 2000 and 2003, two thirds of our street network was built. So that means two thirds of our street network will go into the next life cycle. So once again, your roof, your furnace, and your air conditioning will all need to repair at the same year. Um, and that is something that I, I want you to focus on because you can't get cut up, caught up in just the average PCI. You want to make sure that you are developing a pavement management program that gets you in a cycle. Um, we want to make sure that we are doing a preventative uh, maintenance, a preservative maintenance, and a repair one-third of our system. So every three years, we each street, well, not each street, but uh, every three years, we'll make sure that our network has either done one of these treatments. So, where are we and where are we headed? This is uh, a pie, these are two pie charts that show our current conditions um, and 10 years from now um, using our current practices. And I said that at 80 PCI looked pretty good. Um, in 2014 it doesn't. We have over 79% in satisfactory or better. However, just 10 years from now, um, we'll have over two thirds of our system in the fair condition. Um, now one thing you need to know about the fair condition is that's the last stage where maintenance is a viable option. You move into your poor category after fair and that's when you start spending your repair dollars. Um, and I'll show you in this slide, uh, on this PowerPoint, that it, it exponentially goes up in cost when you move from maintenance to repair. And once again, doing anything two-thirds at a time is not really a good maintenance plan. So what is good, fair, poor, serious? What are these things that I'm talking about? Well, these are actual uh, pictures of this previous summer of the streets and uh, their current condition. Um, you have to your far left a good condition, PCI rating of 93 Locust Street. Um, you have Colleen Drive, a PCI 59, which is fair. Now, fair, there's still going to be distresses. You also you see the crack soon that has been done previously, um, as well as you have your poor and your serious, which you have extensive crack sealing on the poor, and in the serious you have a multiple distresses, which you have crack sealing, patching, um, all types of distresses. And this is not necessarily widespread, but we have a significant amount, 9% of our infrastructure that are rated poor or below. Now, our PCI, it takes into account the age of the pavement, uh, the different distresses, the thickness of the pavement, as well as other factors. This is a snapshot. This is a quarter section, which is a quarter square mile of our uh, city of Gardner. As you can see, there is a, a diverse amount of different distresses where there are level of service. You have pavement that is in good condition, you have pavement that goes as bad as serious. Um, now, you look at this snapshot and you would think, well, let's just go in and fix the bad roads. That is, 
That is not the best practice, but that is normally what common sense tells us to do. But if we go in there and we just fix the, the ones that are in poor or below, and we don't do anything to keep our good roads good, as our philosophy says, we'll just be coming back and more, more, more of our streets in the same quarter section will be below poor. And so with a pavement management system, you'll go in this same quarter section and you'll fix the, the pavements that are poor and below, but also you will do some type of preventative maintenance to the ones that are in good um, and satisfactory condition so that you don't have to come back the next year um, and spinning your wheels all over again. So who's using pavement management? Well, City of Gardner is not yet, but we're moving towards that. Um, one of the things that our, this chart shows you here is that our comparable city, the city of Ramo, which is actually in Missouri, is our most comparable city in size as well as they have just implemented a pavement management program. In 2011, they implemented their pavement management program. They did this to protect their investment. Prior to 2011, they spent $7.8 million reconstructing and rebuilding their infrastructure. Um, you don't spend that type of money without protecting uh, and, and putting in place a pavement management program. Similar in size, uh, at 204, two, 247 lane miles, um, as well as population in square miles. City of Lenexa and City of Overland Park are also on here. Um, City of Overland Park, they have decades of information and pavement um, management techniques um, that City of Gardner has, as well as other cities have borrowed <laughs> and been able to learn from. So additional pavement use, uh, pavement, micro paver uses. This doesn't only or solely utilized for street network. We can also uh, utilize this for our parks and rec and our trail systems. Actually, currently we have already collected data on our asphalt um, trails and has been inputted into the micro paver system. So that analysis is forthcoming. As well as micro paver is versatile, it will take uh, the ratings of asphalt and concrete surfaces. So this program, once again, many uses uh, for our city of Garden. So I've been talking about PCI, I've been talking about this pavement management program, but if you don't have an understanding of how pavement, um, the pavement cycle is, or life cycle is, um, really doesn't make any sense. So, like I said, two, 25 to 30 years is the average uh, life cycle for pavement with maintenance. As you can see by this curve, a majority of the life of any pavement uh, sits somewhere between satisfactory and fair. In that satisfactory or fair range, um, it caught for every dollar that you spend at this point, if you wait till it fails, you'll spend four to five times so looking at this chart, where does that lie? Well, about age 15, <coughs> your streets, or a particular street or any street system will start rapidly deteriorating in the next five years. As I mentioned earlier, 2000 and 2000, between 2000 and 2003 is when like two thirds of our street network <coughs> is built. If you do the math, and this is programmed for 2016, that's an average uh, life of 15 years. So currently, we sit about here. So we're right on the cusp of uh, falling off the curve of maintenance into, um, I, I would say, the slide of repair. Um, so we can invest now or we can invest later. Um, but one thing I know is we will have to invest in our street network. So I gave you this bad news. So Abdul, what are you going to do? What are, you, what are we going to do? So if you have pavement deterioration plus maintenance, as I was mentioning earlier, our, per, our preservation, um, that average of six to eight years of extending that pavement life. We don't have a fountain of youth, but we are able to get more life out of our pavement. So one treatment of either chip seal or microsurfacing will extend the life cycle. And if you do that two times, it extended another um, six to eight years. Now, even if you spent $2 at this stage, if you waited 
-hmm. Five years, you would have spent five times that and you wouldn't have had the same quality of road. So I mean, that's the benefit of a pavement management program, making sure that you are proactive rather than reactive, because you're going to have to spend the money. Not to be too forceful, but you will have to spend that money. So recommended program for our residential and collector streets. Once again, um, the chart on the pie chart on your left shows where we currently are and to, will, will be in 2016. That's the beauty of the program. You can put in what year um, you want and it'll show you what your system will look like. <coughs> and what we want to do in the first three years is eliminate that 9% uh, which falls in the poor or below category, which is going to cost in the upwards of $6.6 .6 million. However, that is the investment of repairing your street network. Now after that, and we fall into the maintenance, it significantly decreases our average of $615,000. As well as you can see on the pie chart, you see a nice, I couldn't have done this better if I did it myself, but I did. Um, <laughs> this, this is one third, one third, and one third basically. Making sure that our life cycle, uh, any t all of our maintenance <coughs> procedures, we do it in a one third cycle. And this is also gonna help for our maintenance crews, because if they know what's coming the next year, they can prep uh, for that type of treatment. We can go out and we can bid um, for these projects uh, in a time when bidding is advantageous for the city and not the contractor. Um, not that I don't like to give the contractor money, but we are to be a gardener. We want to do what's best for our citizens. This program. It is $10 million, over, little, over $10 million over 10 years. Um, but I would like you to think about if you wait even five years, what that number would look like when you have to do two thirds of your system in repair mode rather than maintenance. This recommended program, um, I mentioned our, our two options, um, which was the microservicing and the chip seal. The city of Gardner, we're going to uh, use a combination of this is not going to be solely um, microservicing or chip sealing, but we want to present both options. We, we as a public works department are going to identify what application is best um, for uh, the area. As you can see, per lane mile um, for the microservicing, in the maintenance side of it, this is just taking uh, years 7 through 10 is about 3000 uh, dollars per lane mile. City of Overland Park, uh, they spent just last year uh, a little over $5,000 per lane mile. Um, one thing to note in theirs is that they took into account their arterial uh, roads and we are going to present that in a separate uh, presentation. Ours is solely residential and collector roads. Just give you a little background with residential collector and arterial roads. If you're not familiar, it's just a classification of uh, level of service, the level of volume um, that that street is taking on. So residential roads, those are the streets in front of your house. Collector streets are going to be roads like Madison and Kill Creek, um, and your arterial roads are going to be center um, and moonlight. Um, I want to point out here Raymore. Um, they're programmed in 2015. The reason I uh, point out Raymore because they're the city that's most comparable to us. Um, they are programmed uh, to spend about $37,000 per lane mile. And I've been working extensively with them uh, to understand their program. And actually, after 2015, they're hoping to even get that down to about $600,000 uh, per year. Uh, annual cost. So it is a fluid process. I mean, the more you in, you take the time to understand your system, the more money you can save. And that's the importance of a comprehensive pavement management program. So with that, I'll take it off the numbers so you're not so anxious and have any questions. Question for Mr. Uh, 
an additional conversation, and I'm not sure, Phyllis, this is for you or for Brian, but as a result of these maintenance uh, programs, um, no matter what, uh, I guess, phase we're in, I'm assuming that there is an operational resource uh, plan that goes along with this. So for instance, if we're talking about rehabbing streets, um, would we, do we have the capability to do that with internal resources, do we have the equipment, or would that be uh, truly contractor work? And then kind of the same on just the ongoing maintenance. So not that you have to answer that today, but I, I'm assuming that there's kind of a give and take in, in internally a plan that would support. Right, and I can answer that. I okay. mean, the uh, preservation, where we talk about microsurfacing and chip silt as contractor, reconstruction as contractor. Uh, what city crews can do, we do the crack ceiling, pothole repairs, things like that. And so what the micro paver program will do, there's a lot of components within it. <coughs> It'll actually define these are the areas you need to crack seal. These are the areas you need to put a surface treatment down. These are the areas you need to reconstruct. And so what we'll do with the best we can with our forces, we'll knock out those <coughs> items like crack ceiling and things like that. Okay. Uh, I, I also think this is great. Um, I think it's a, definitely a positive step. Um, can you describe though the like logistics of then of the ongoing updating of the uh, um, program? So in other words, if, if certain roads become more heavily trafficked or certain potholes or cracks with these things develop, how is that logistically handled? There's so, I mean, that, that's an excellent question. Um, how the micropaver um, software and program works is that it is ongoing. So what we're going to do, luckily I won't have to um, do the whole system again in one summer. What you typically do is you would go out and you would examine um, or inspect one third of your system. So every three years you have looked at your whole system. Um, as well as any time you do a program um, maintenance or preservation treatment, all you have to do is uh, put that in the programs that I that is completed, and what it will do is it will increase the PCI of that condition, um, and then again it will model another curve as I showed um, in the, in the slideshow. Then when you get out there within the next three years, you'll be able to verify if that is falling on the curve. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does. Yeah. Yeah, I've got a couple of things. Uh, I, I, I'm somewhat familiar with the, with the micropaper system. Okay. And, uh, and I understand the, 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 uh, the metrics that come out of it. And that's one of the things that obviously, you know, Public Works hasn't had access to that information. Um, most of the uh, things they've had to do with the road patching has been anecdotal, uh, complaint driven. Again, that's reactive, and not proactive. And so I think it's a great step forward. The question I've got is uh, from the standpoint of funding. You can answer this question, but I would like to address this question maybe to Nancy and, and to, uh, uh, to Cheryl. It has to do with you know how we would, if we decided to move forward with this recommendation and start talking about actual repairs, um, the nitty gritty of you know doing the repairs and the and the, and the, and the, the patching and the other things that have to do that have to happen. How are we going to, how will we finance that? Would that be coming out of operational budget or would that be coming out of a, out of a CIP? Um, going forward and long term, how would we be able to incorporate this into a long term budget um, uh, solution? Here we go. So, first of all, mm -hmm. if the governing body so deems that street improvements are priority one, mm -hmm. we will make it happen. Sure. Um, it's, it's a budget policy decision. Just like everything else, you are going to end up weighing out your competing um, programs and you will, we will use a combination, as we always do, of probably debt funding. You'll have grant funding, CARS, and you'll be able to leverage with some other things like that. Um, and we will build in a certain amount of ongoing maintenance. That will be in your operating budget. So I don't, I'm not going to be able to build in the 6.6. .6. Yeah, that's what I was <laughs> that, That's probably that's not going to happen. That. That's, the, that's the big <laughs> ticket. Yeah, we don't need it all in one year. Yeah. It was a three-year three -year, three -year catch-up. And we would be able to leverage, you know, Brian and those guys are great at getting your cars money and whatever else is out there. So, and have we talked with the uh, bond council about the possibility of uh, doing some bonding for some of that 
uh, repair work in the short term? Uh, we have not discussed this particular priority with bond council, but she is always a phone call away, as well as your financial advisor, and it is uh, no more than planning, like we always do for any budget issue, and okay. that, that would be at your direction. So to expand on that, the, the purpose of tonight, mm -hmm. um, as well as some of the future meetings, we committed to you during the budget cycle that we would give you an assessment of your infrastructure in line with your priorities of infrastructure and asset management. We started with pavement. We're going to present to you water, wastewater, and electric. And then we're going to ask you to give us some guidance and direction on what your priorities would be. And then we will meet with the financial advisor and bond council based on the direction that you provide. Okay, good. And the, other, the last question I have was that had to do with the arterial because obviously the arterial roads are great, the fastest. They are the most heavily traveled. And I know it's not incorporated within the paper management program as it currently stands here. Um, do you happen to have some ideas about the current state of our arterials? Um, I know that uh, there are certain parts of the center that are definitely in the fair uh, category. <coughs> and, uh, and I know that we've already, we've already had this extensive work on moonlight and well, I can, I can say with confidence that our arterial roads, um, our streets, are actually uh, in better condition than our residential and our collective streets. Um, we do have um, a program in place for that once again that we'll present, um, but we're going, um, and I'll let Brian speak on it, um, to find different funds for that. But we have a system in place um, to present as well, and Brian can add on that. But, and I would add that the arterials, you know, we've reconstructed Moonlight. Mm -hmm. uh, we've submitted the CARS funding for Center Street for uh, the future. Uh, those streets, so while they're heavily traveled, uh, the section that was, was put in place is much thicker. Uh, it's a better road section, so it has been holding up fairly well. So, and, and all the data has been collected, and actually um, that kind of skewed the results a little bit when we actually had residential collector and arterials, because the arterials were actually um, in, in fairly good shape, uh, but they're very expensive when you're looking at four lanes or five lane roads that run the length of the city. Um, that'll blow your budget just trying to do a little bit of one. And so that's why we concentrated on the residential and collectives at the time. I was thinking specifically about the portion of the center between Grand and Warren, which includes the realtors. That's uh, all the arterials that are really part of the <coughs> And, and the worst part of that's actually southbound, just past the viaduct, is because I've had about half a dozen water main breaks in the last year. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Mayor, may I expand just a little bit on the previous conversation? Yes. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, you do, we have discussed, one other option for funding of your streets is that your park sales tax uh, expires at 2015. And we have mentioned that you could, as other cities do, renew a dedicated source of funding in the form of a sales tax, which would actually be very appropriate since it's people driving on your streets from other cities, um, purchasing goods and services, that would be a, essentially a user fee. Uh, you could create a sales tax for a very specific purpose of street improvements and or other things. So it's just something else to mention, that you could shift it to streets if you so choose. Understood. Uh, other questions? Joel, uh, as, a, as we look at this and we talk about, you know, after the, the big expense up front to try to get things all within the, the third and third pie chart, is there a cycle then that the software looks at and says when you should expect that next sort of balloon investment to come along? Is it every eight to 10 years you'd expect to have that size investment again to catch up roads that may have fallen below where they were at uh, a, uh, not repair, but uh, where they've fallen into the repair grade and maintenance is no longer an option. Is that, is that eight to 10 years, or, or do we know with any sort of what to expect of bank loans in that case? That's a great question, and I'll, I'll answer it in this way. Because we are going to provide a maintenance program, um, in our philosophy, uh, step one, I believe, is to maintain all of our roads at PCI of 55 or above. So in our system, we're not going to let any of our roads get to our, uh, below 
uh, the poor. And with our maintenance cycle, you're going to crack seal your preventive maintenance every three years, you're going to do your preservation maintenance every six years, um, and then you are going to do your uh, repair between 25 to 30 years, uh, but you'll be able to identify and take into account if you need to do it a little sooner or if you have a little bit of leeway on extending it closer to 30 years. But the goal of having a preventive maintenance plan is that we don't have any of our street system um, falling or at significant percent, I'll say, because and below poor. And that, and that if, as long as you continue the cycle, um, you won't have the potential to have a significant amount of your street network um, where you have to do repair. But you will have to repair roads no matter what program you're in, but you'll have that budgeted within that um, $615,000. Is there a point within that life cycle, and we inspect the road and it's dropped to, let's use a BPI of 65 to 60, where it's better than we just, and the software will help us understand that, and then the staff itself, it's, it's better to repair at that point because the next patch or the next maintenance will only move it up so far and it'll likely degrade quicker. Is that just analyzing the life cycle of that particular section of road, or? If it was at a 65 to 70, um, like you mentioned, um, which that I believe is in the fair range, uh, it depends on the, the actual age of the pavement. Okay. If you've had two to three treatments of microsurfacing or chip sealing on it already, you need to consider um, repairing that. Okay. But it's going to be a repair more so than a reconstruct. Um, I want to make sure that I'm clear on what a repair and a reconstruct sure. is. A repair is, all right, I'm going to mill off the top two to three inches of surface treatments that I've been put on there and put on brand new asphalt. A reconstruct is if you have issues that have gotten into your subgrade, which your subgrade um, is basically large rock that's compacted and gives you that foundation of your surface you're driving on. And once you have to get into that, that is when you open up a bag of worms um, and that's when you'll have to see a lot of different um, creative ways to fix your pavement. Sure. Great. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't really have any questions. I pretty much echoed the statements of everybody else. That this is a wonderful start. I don't think, I mean, it doesn't seem like we've ever had anything like this. If we had, it's been away a long time ago. Um, and my main question was the funding, but I feel like Steve's got that. So this is this is a great start. Uh, when do we anticipate the, the other studies of way, the, uh, water and wastewater? We're coming back to you next month and we'll start to talk about um, the electric water with water and then we will um, come back to you in March and talk about how that integrate, how this information is used to integrate into our capital improvement program. So next month. Great information. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Brian, you were in Raymore when they were instituting this program, weren't you? Good. I'm glad, I'm glad that you were familiar with your experience with it, helping develop it there, I'm sure. And, then, and the nice thing is, whether it's Overland Park or Raymore, the staff that's working on those in those communities have been extremely helpful. Um, mm -hmm. So it's real nice to work with those folks. <coughs> uh, Steve, you know, the next item on the agenda is public comment. Members of the Public are welcome to use this time to make comments about city matters or items on the agenda that are not part of the public hearing. If anyone has any comments they would like to make, please step to the podium, state your name and address for the record, and be heard. Jim Wetherington, 1662 Dilly Road, Gardner, Kansas. I, I think the mayor should reconsider and remove the conceal to carry sign. It conceal gun carry sign. Uh, a Gardner citizen can go to Topeka State Capitol with a conceal to carry, but he cannot come into City Hall and pay a lecture. Thank you. 
Thank you, Jim. With no one else coming forward, we'll move on to the consent agenda. Is there a council member that would like to remove an item from the consent agenda? <coughs> if not, I would entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Motion Harrison, second Freeman, that we approve the consent agenda. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? Consent agenda passes. New business item number one, consider the purchase of two Ford Police Interceptor Ford Utility Vehicles <coughs> from Shawnee Mission Ford. Uh, Captain Belcher, good evening. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Council Members. Thank you for your time tonight. Uh, staff, staff is recommending the purchase of two Ford Police Interceptor Sport Utility Vehicles from Shawnee Mission Ford util utilizing the State of Kansas bid and services from KCOM Incorporated and Sign Here Incorporated for equipment and vehicle decal installation. The total estimated cost for the two completed vehicles is $63,967.74. The 2015 budget includes $71,000 for the purchase of two Ford Police Interceptor SUVs for frontline use. The budget item includes the cost of the purchase of the two SUVs along with the existing equipment, installation, and decal costs for both vehicles. The state of Kansas bid was from Shawnee Mission Ford and it came in at $25,045. Uh, several vehicle options were added for safety. Uh, as you see that the, the breakdown of the vehicle, uh, 25045 is the baseline cost. Uh, safety uh, features that were added for $1,196, taking the total vehicle cost of $26,241. The uh, equipment uh, installation estimated at $33,742.87. The decal installation estimate of $2,000 brings us to $31,983.87 per car. Uh, the total estimate cost for two SUVs is $63,967.74. I believe, Jeannie, we have a, we have a picture. <coughs> Just so you, in case you don't know what the Ford Interceptor SUV looks like. Um, we are asking uh, you to authorize the city administrator to purchase two Ford Police Interceptor SUVs from Shawnee Mission Ford for a total cost of $52,482. Under the city's purchasing policy, the city will also obtain services from KCOM Inc. and Sign Here Inc. for equipment and uh, vehicle decal installation. The total amount to purchase and equip each vehicle will be $31,983.87 for a total cost of $63,967.74. With the presentation completed, we will open the floor for public comments. If there's a member of the public that would like to make a comment regarding new business item number one, please step forward and be heard. Are we safe to assume? Captain Belcher Craig. Uh, questions for Captain <coughs> Belcher regarding the purchase. Yeah. Uh, Yes, I have, I, have, uh, I have three specific questions. Okay. The first one, Captain, is um, this particular purchase we discussed on the dais during budget time was to um, help put us in a position where we could better respond in times of inclement weather. Yes, sir. Uh, specifically, you know, winter weather, things like, you know, uh, or, or, or flooding or things like that, where a standard vehicle would, would work. And yes, sir. As of right now, or for the last however many years, significant amount of time, mm -hmm. uh, our, our offices and going out and personally use vehicles to respond to those calls. That is correct. They don't have the technology. Um, the second question, I just wanted to make sure that was correct. The second question I had was, if we were to order Well, these, let, let me back up. Yes, yes. We, we do have two four-wheel drives right now that we can put in service. Okay. Uh, both of them are aging vehicles. I a 1992 pickup truck, which is not... Uh, conducive for patrol and then uh, an aging uh, explorer that we're, that we can use also. Yeah, so they're not practical. That's correct. Just that. and that's why you're using personal vehicles right now. Correct. Um, the second question is, if we were to order these vehicles or authorize the 
purchase tonight. Yes, sir. When would these vehicles go into service? Three to, three to four months uh, delivery time on those vehicles is what Sean Mission 4 is telling us. So we're talking April and May? I think that that's very accurate estimation. So they would not go into service with the winter this year? Because not unless a miracle happens right now. <laughs> last time I talked to Sean Mission 4, which was last year before the Christmas break, they were still three to four months out. Okay. Those two questions kind of set up a third, which is uh, we don't have a chief right now. Mm -hmm. And we're making decisions right now that, I, that the chief might want to weigh in on. I understand this is something that we've been needing for a long time. But if the <coughs> chief comes in, he finds that he has uh, priorities that might supersede the purchase of two vehicles right now. Mm -hmm. is, it, is it something that we want to necessarily you know, put on the new chief, given the fact that we don't have one? decisions like, for example, the Senate and some, some other decisions that have been made without a, a chief being seated. So that's, that's my biggest concern right now. Okay. Uh, not that there's no need. I see a need. But my concern is that we don't have a chief right now that's, that's making, you know, that's, that's weighing in these decisions. Okay. So I, I, I personally, I would like to delay this until we have a chief in place. My, my personal opinion on that is, I mean, we can delay any nothing but hurt the people that are here actually working. <coughs> so from my perspective, I mean, I, I, I think uh, Acting Chief Felcher is very well qualified to make these recommendations and uh, support his department and what's needed. So I, I see no reason to delay. I, I agree with Christy on this. I think it's just long overdue that we need these and I would support it. Agreed. Other questions or comments? Uh, oh, I did. Will these be replacing a vehicle or? What's that? Adding, will these be replacing vehicles or adding two? They're they're going to be replacing one. We're going to keep we're going to keep one. So actually, the the number that, that you guys see before you on that bottom line estimate is sixty three nine. That's going to come down a little bit with the trade in value, which we're still uh, <coughs> trying to to finalize that. But we're. We're hoping that we're looking at $2,500 to $5,000 on a trade-in right now. That, that's a good question, Todd, but also, would that be trading in a, a vehicle, a, a sedan, or? It'd or be trading in a sedan, yes, sir. That's what I thought, okay. Just wanted clarification on that. And Mr. Shoot, mm -hmm. I don't know that, that I could answer your question. Uh, as far as you know, whether we should should wait. I mean, I know that we have the need now, and to get them now would be the price could go up. Th these prices could go up in six months. Sure. This this bid is only good until July. Um, you know, it just depends on the philosophy of the chief that's coming in. You know, what they want to think uh, or, or how they want to prioritize things. Um, yeah. I know that you know you understand that we have an aging fleet, and, and I get all that. Um, I just don't know that I that I really would be able to answer your question. You know, not knowing the philosophy of the unknown that's coming in. That's correct, and I'm hoping that we have a chief in six months. I mean, that's, I mean, but but you know, I that was my that was my concern. If there's a consensus on the on the on the council to move forward, then obviously that's where we're going. But you know, I'm I I just want to make sure that we have. And I'm not I'm not doubting your your ability or anything no. like that. I just know that we have a chief that's coming in. And I know they may have a different. And I understand there's an urgency. I understand that we can use these, you know, personal vehicles for years and years. I mean, it opens us up to potential liability sure. and things like that. And I don't want to have that risk. But again, you know, a couple of months is that you know, that's a sign. Given the fact that we have a lot of space to do this, you know, and we would still have the vehicle. staff recommendation, right? Uh, and I'll, I mean, I'll mention, and I, I think that you can provide a little backup and uh, the city administrator might be able to as well. I, I mean, this is something that was identified by Captain Moore after the passing of Chief Francis, uh, and, and also something that, that the former Chief Cullenberg, uh was, was behind as well, correct? Yes. And Cheryl, we had some assessments done 
uh, by the sheriff's department uh, in conjunction with the, the search that actually ended up with hitting Chief Tolliver? Right. And was, there a, was there a recommendation pointed, from? They pointed to need for equipment and training, career progression, so all of the things that we've brought in terms of career progression, which we've been in, training, which we've enhanced, as well as equipment, we started to move on those things based on their recommendation of the need to really improve and enhance our police department, so yes. That did include the, the, the SUV, the Captain Belcher's truck. The SUV, as well as this item was presented when we did the budget yes. by the chief and the captain at the time. So this budget was, you'll recall, presented last spring. Yeah. Okay, very good. Got a question for Tom? If not, I'd entertain a motion on new business item number one. So moved. Second. Motion Harrison, second winners. And we authorize the city administrator to purchase two Ford Police Interceptor SUVs from Shawnee Mission Ford for a total cost of $52,482. Under the city purchasing policy, the city will also obtain services from KCOM Incorporated and sign here for equipment installation and vehicle decals. Total amount to purchase and equip each vehicle will be $31,982.87 with the total cost for both vehicles at $63,967.74. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? No. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. New business item number two. Consider addendum number three to the February two February 17, 2012. Power lines, right of way, and tree trimming agreement with with Aspen. Street Expert Company. Paper Green, good evening. Good evening. Uh, regular tree trimming along power lines is a uh, <coughs> important part, important task to ensure system reliability. Uh, Gardner Electric Utility began a formal tree trimming program on a four-year cycle in 2010. In 2011, the Electric Utility Board at the time adopted a formal tree clearance policy. In its first four years, 2010 through 2013, uh, the trees, uh, this a maintenance or a establishment program uh, where trees were trimmed like eight to 10 foot of clearance uh, from the power lines and uh, when possible trimmed uh, trees underneath. Uh, one thing I will say that the uh, staff goes out before any of these programs, uh, reviews all the sites and gets with the landowners prior to the beginning of the program. 2015 program, excuse me, the 2014 program was the first year of a uh, retracing of the first year of 2010. Uh, you'll notice in the prices we spent, uh, the cost for the first four years were 100,000 plus. Uh, in 2014, to retrace the uh, steps of the uh, 2010 program cost about 50,000. 2015 will retrace the 2011 program, which is uh, primarily the manor area uh, along Shawnee, both sides uh, to the uh, northwest of uh, Center and Main, and then along Shawnee Street on both sides uh, from roughly Sycamore to White Street, a little smaller program. The 2012 program was contracted to Aspen Tree Expert. Uh, the contract documents allow for contract extensions for up to four years. The Electric Utility Board approved addendums one and two, which renewed the contract for 2013 and 2014, respectively. Uh, in each of those renewals, Aspen was allowed to adjust their rates for each extension. Uh, the Electric Utility Advisory Board, which is now the Electric, excuse me, the Utility Advisory Commission, uh, discussed renewing the Aspen contract for 2015, which will be the third renewal at its December 4th meeting. Uh, the board approved a recommendation to this body uh, for the approval of Addendum 3. Addendum 3 does several things. Number one, it changes all contract references that currently say Gardner Energy to uh, City of Gardner. Uh, also adopts the billing rates, which reflect 
a 3% increase in labor rates and a 9% increase in equipment rates over the 2014 extension, which is uh, effectively about a three, little less than a 4% increase overall. Uh, the effective hourly rate for a crew is about $118, or roughly 47.50 for 40 hours a week. Uh, the recommended motion would be to cap the uh, 2015 contract payments at 100,000. This is recommended our electric <coughs> distribution budget for 2015 has uh, 50,000 for tree trimming program and an additional 50,000 for uh, specific projects should they be needed. Uh, we're recommending just uh, setting the authorization at 100,000 to allow for this program which will take uh, four to six weeks uh, which could take up 30 to 45 thousand dollars and then we'll allow additional authorization should we have an emergency or projects come up. To say it's built on a actual use on a per week basis. The work would begin in March. Uh, staff would be canvassing the route and notifying landowners of the project if they would. Thank you. Uh, at this time, we'll open the floor for uh, public comment regarding new business item number two. If anyone present that would like to make comments about the tree trimming program, now is your opportunity. Hey, Mr. Mayor, I'm Stephen Tancredi, 408 East Johnny Street. Are you going to do the ones on East on East Johnny or just on the other side of the center? Uh, on East Johnny also. Are you going to go back behind the houses and cut? Yes. Are you cutting trees in the yard where the, where the fire lines go through? We would be cutting within the easement on the power where the building behind the property should stay. No, we're, I mean if it goes from the power line back to the house. Uh, no, that is landowner property. Well, that's a landowner responsibility. Okay. I was curious about that. I was very curious about that. You know, you start cutting trees and I've got a free tree, free trim. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at, I'm looking, Mr. Mayor, I'm looking at $35,000. You guys gave away last, last two weeks ago to the, to the other guys. Okay. I think she, if you can't give me a free job, like you gave the other guys $35,000 on free money. Okay. Well, thank you. Questions for 